Uh, so we're just so grateful for you here. Let me share with you about what we believe, who we are as a church, what we truly believe. Uh, number one, we believe that there's hope beyond our brokenness. We believe that, that right where you are, we're glad that you're here, that the hope that we have is not found in our own efforts to save ourselves or to renew ourselves or to transform ourselves. Our hope is in the one who does the saving and renewing and transformation. And his name is Jesus. Amen. Amen. Second, we believe that we're called to trust our risen Savior. Right? Don doesn't trust anybody. That's why he locks the drum boot. <laughs> right? But we're called to trust in our risen Savior. Amen? Amen. Sorry. I had to write. I had to write. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. why It's not even true. Um, we're called to trust in our risen Savior. What does that mean? It means to be honest with Jesus. It means to, to, to talk with him about your life. It means to listen to him. Trust means that you'd, that you'd actually follow his directions because you believe that he's good. And third, what we believe is that we're called to bring restoration, to love and care for the people in our lives, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And the good news is that you don't have to be perfect to do any of this. You don't need a seminary degree to do any of this. God is inviting you to do this right now. So each one of you has the ability to participate in this, this mission that we call the life of faith. And it means that you'd make a choice. And that choice looks like this. And we read this every week. Ready? Let's read it again. A disciple is one who walks intentionally with God, choosing to be changed by Jesus. And choosing to join Jesus in his resurrection work. Amen? Amen? So today, we're going to start a brand new sermon series on the books of First and Second Samuel. And so we're going to be uh, looking at David's life. And, uh, and that will we'll stop Second Samuel at, in the, right at the end of David's life. And that'll be right before Easter. And so today, I want to give you a little bit of background. And I want to talk about... The, the moment right before we meet David in 1 Samuel 16, and this is the end of King Saul's reign, and 1 Samuel 15 verse 1 goes like this, Samuel, who's the prophet, Samuel said to Saul, I'm the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. L read this next one, next part with me. So listen now to the message from the Lord. So Saul's one job as the king of Israel is to what? Listen, is to listen to God. That's it. That's his job. Listen to God. So before I give you the background of this passage and its history and its context within world politics, let me just say that that's your job too. Your job is to listen to God. That's where life is. Life is listening and following God's heart and direction for you. Um, all of us have the story of trying to find hope and peace and joy without listening to God. How did that work, y'all? Not good, right? Do you want to repair your life? Listen to God. Do you want to repair your family, your community, your place of work? Listen to God. It's that simple. It's not complicated. And so today's passage is about what happens when we don't listen to God. It's about what happens when someone confronts us with our own pride and rebellion. And it's just about a story about what happens when we don't repent. But today just can't be about failure because the heart of today's passage is about how God wants us to lead our lives and our families in such a way in which mistakes can be healed and broken lives can be restored and chaos can turn back into order. And I'm guessing we all want that, right? So can we pray and then we'll get going. Holy Spirit, thank you for being here. We pray protection over this space and this time now in Jesus' name. We mute and bind up anything opposed to Christ that would be seeking to put us to sleep, to interfere with this time. Lord, help. We love you. Awaken our hearts and our spirits. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Break off and the chain that would be binding us. Lift off the mask or the blindfold that would keep us in the dark. Help us, Lord Jesus. 
We need you. And all God's beloved saints said, Amen. Amen. Did you get a bacon stick? <laughs> if you want another one. Oh, they're all gone, aren't they? <laughs> okay, where are we in, in Israel's history? The exodus has happened. Uh, Joshua has settled the land. Uh, tr a tribal confederacy, almost like this, how our United States are joined together, a tribal confederacy emerged in which each one of the 12 tribes, um, they would be bound together not only because of their lineage and their shared experience, but they decided that they would be led by two people. Moses was unique. Moses was a prophet and a judge. Prophet is someone who spoke the truth and spoke what he saw God doing and what God wanted. A judge was simply that, right? An administrative and civil authority that helped sort out the community, okay? Moses was unique in that he held those two offices at the same time, prophet and judge. They couldn't find anybody to do that, so they decided to split up those offices. And so as Joshua settles into the land, there's prophets, and then there are judges, and both of their job descriptions are the same. Listen to God. Does that make sense? Anybody ever read the book of Judges? How's that go? Not good. And the one line that is repeated over and over and over again in the book of Judges is everybody went their own way. And that's why everything turned into chaos. There was heartbreak, there was famine, there was failure, relationships and families are destroying, being destroyed. There's two great judges, one named Samson, do you remember him? Long hair, worked out. Another named Deborah, incredible strong woman, right? So we had men and women leading in Israel's history in incredible ways. And then lots of really bad judges and prophets. Then there was one woman, an incredible woman. Her name is Hannah. And at the end of Judges, at the beginning of 1 Samuel, this is the first woman in a long time that actually listens to God. So the story of Samuel and then Saul and then David and Solomon, the whole salvation story of, of Israel starts with a woman named Hannah. Isn't that cool? Yeah, I got saved because there was a cute girl at church, <laughs> right? I mean, ladies are, you guys are incredible. You have such power and such leadership and such gifts. Use them, amen? amen. So Hannah decides to listen to God. And so what she does is she has a son named Samuel and God says, you know what, Samuel's going to be a prophet and I want you to take him to the local to the epicenter of worship, which wasn't Jerusalem. It was actually north of Jerusalem at a town called Shiloh. And there you're going to take Samuel to the tabernacle where the Ark of the Covenant is, where worship happens. And you're going to let, Samuel's going to learn how to be a priest. And so Samuel goes to Shiloh, learns how to be a priest from a lousy priest. But Samuel does something totally unique. He mimics his mother and he listens to God as well. And as Samuel then steps into the role of prophet, um, of course, he's in a time and an era where just like the book of Judges, everything is a literal and figurative mess. Does that make sense? And Israel is looking around and they're looking to the north, which is where Assyria is. The Assyrians were incredible warriors, vicious, cruel, awful, but incredible warriors. And they have an amazing kingdom, which capital was Nineveh, modern day Mosul. And the, the Israelites said, man, the Ninevites, they really know what they're doing. Like they're like a, wow, warring, strong tribe. And then they look to their east and they saw the Babylonians, where the seven, one of the seven wonders of the world was, the hanging gardens of Babylon. And they looked at the Babylonians, led by a giant pickle named Nebuchadnezzar. 
You've seen the VeggieTales one, right? And, and they're like, wow, that's pretty incredible. Like Nebuchadnezzar, he's amazing. And, and that's pretty great. And then they look south because um, south is always down on the map. And do you ever notice that? Uh, and then they look south and they looked at Egypt and they saw the Sphinx and the Pharaohs and the pyramids. And they thought, wow, this is pretty incredible. Pharaoh is this, this art and economic powerhouse. I want to be like Pharaoh. And so they looked around at these three kingdoms and they said, you know, we don't even have a king. We need a king. And so Samuel, who's the only one authorized to even anoint or coronate a king, urges the people, well, you know, God is your king. That's the design here, y'all. And they said, no, 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 we need a king. And so God picks out this nobody from the crowd. He was a tall, good-looking guy, but still a nobody. His name was Saul, and Samuel anoints Saul to be king. And at first, first and second Samuel, first Samuel tells the story of Saul's rise. Um, and things are going really, really well. The battles that he fights, he wins. Uh, the, the, the chaos within the 12 tribes subsides. Order is brought back. Famine ends. The harvests are good. All is well. And so First and Second Samuel are going to tell the story of Saul's rise and then his fall, of David's rise and then his fall, and about how these 12 tribes turned from a confederacy into an actual kingdom. You picking up what I'm putting down? Good. Amen. Wonderful. Great. Now, up to this point, um, things have gone pretty well for Saul. He's listening to God. He's leading the people away from idolatry towards worshiping Yahweh. Um, and there's one reason why Saul is successful. Read it with me. Are you ready? Samuel the prophet and Saul the king are listening to God. This will be the theme of First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. When you listen to God, things go. When you don't listen to God, things go. It's, yeah, things go south. <laughs> Egypt. They go to Egypt. That's where it is, right? So God, yet again, is going to speak to Saul through Samuel. Now, um, what is God going to say to Samuel and then, then to Saul? He's going to say this. It's time to bring justice to the, a group of people called the Amalekites. The Amalekites were Isis Jr. Okay. The Amalekites first attacked Israel right when, they, when Israel fled from Pharaoh, crossed the Red Sea, and they're exhausted. They got nothing, no weapons, no way of defense. The Amalekites came, attacked them, killed thousands, and took stuff, and, and it was like, man, you attacked us right at our weak point. Um, and that's what the Amalekites did. Um, do you remember when Joshua fought the battle of Jericho? He was fighting another group of people called the Amorites, very similar. Both the Amorites and the Amalekites, they were tribes of people. They lasted over a thousand years. There is nothing in history um, that we can find, archaeology or anything, that says that they built anything. But among the nations and tribes of people that built fortifications and towns and art and poetry and pottery, all of them describe the Amorites and the Amalekites doing the exact same thing, which was they, they made a living destroying whatever other people built, killing innocent people, ransacking villages and towns, and murdering nomadic tribesmen, their families, and taking their livestock. That's what the Amorites and the Amalekites did. Isis Jr. Does that make sense? Okay. So at this point, God has heard the cries of all of these people who've been murdered and said, it's time, Saul, now that you're strong enough for you to go destroy the army of the Amalekites and their supply train so they can no longer wage war on the innocents around you. Picking up what I'm putting down? Now, God tells Saul this. Do not attack the Amalekites to steal their stuff. Destroy it all. Totally destroy them all. That's the army. This is not about your greatness. This is about my justice. That's in 
parentheses, kind of paraphrasing what God says. Now, does that seem harsh? If it does, let me ease your horror. Um, we get mice in our garage all the time. We have a mouse in our garage right now. I think multiple mice in our garage. April told me last night, Andy, you need to take care of our mice problem. So I think I know what that means, right? When she says care or take care of the mice, that's not, that doesn't mean cuddle. That doesn't mean feed or pet. That means to take care of them. Now, April's not telling me to take care of all the mice. Answer it, it might be me. Um, they might, they're not, she's not telling me to take care of all the mice in the zip code. You picking up what I'm putting down? She's not taking, asking me to take care of all the mice on the earth. She's asking me to take care of our mice problem they're eating our Christmas decorations and defecating on the workout equipment, right? It's these specific mice that she wants me to care for. You, you picking up what I'm putting down? <coughs> so, she wants me to totally destroy these mice. And a April is not asking me to scare the mice away or to sweep up their droppings as though they are not there. She wants me to take care of them. You picking up what April's putting down? Okay. In the same way, when God tells his people to totally destroy whatever enemy that they're encountering, this is not a command to genocide. The phrase totally destroy was a common phrase used by mil military leaders, uh, King Xerxes, who fought um, Gerald Butler in the movie 300. Um, this is in about three, four, 425 BC. King Xerxes says, oh, I totally destroyed the Greeks at Thermopylae, which he didn't. He just beat part of their army. Okay, but to totally destroy was smack talk in the ancient Near East. Does that make sense? God tells Joshua, totally destroy the Amorites. Joshua totally destroys the Amorites. Four chapters later, Joshua is fighting the Amorites again. You picking up? To totally destroy means to kick their butts, to, to like beat that group of people in that local place. So God wanted Saul and his army to actually beat the army of the Amalekites. Why? Because he, God didn't want them to just run away and then fight another day. God didn't want them to be able to escape Israel and then go murder and kill other people. God wanted the Amalekites, those warriors who were making life a living hell for everybody that they encountered, he wanted them, those warriors to experience justice. He needed their reign of terror to end. Some of you here today have been hurt by other people and you've asked God for justice. And God hears your prayers. And God will bring justice to the people who've hurt you. And it may not be in the way that you want it to be. It may not be in the timing that you want it to be. But you better be sure that if those people do not repent of what they've done, they will experience all that they have earned. Does that make sense? So, 1 Samuel 15, 7. Let's read this together. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from, from Avila Beach <laughs> to Big Sur <laughs> near the eastern border of, and that's what Marin County feels like, doesn't it? Okay, verse 8. He took Arroyo Grande, <laughs> king of the Amalekites alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. Uh, chapter 30, King Saul will be killed by the Amalekites, so clearly not all of them were destroyed with the sword. 
So Saul and his army killed this particular group of warriors that King Agag is, or Agag, is, uh, is leading. Uh, verse 9, let's find out how well Saul and his army obey. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak they totally destroyed. Why does Saul do this? Three, three reasons, I think. Pride, vanity, and rebellion. If Saul towed Agag behind him, which was the tradition, Saul's on his horse and he's t tying, uh, he's towing a, a bound and defeated king behind him, people are going to look at Saul and go, wow, there's a king, but he's not just a king, he's the king of other kings. He's the king of kings. That's what they're going to say about Saul. And why does Saul spare all the good livestock? Remember, not a whole lot of printed money or coins back in the day. So livestock was cash. And if you wanted to reward all of your warriors, you would reward them with livestock and cash. Right? That would be your cash reward. He wants all of his warriors to love him and care for him. So Saul commits the same crime that Agag and the Amalekites do, raiding just to steal stuff. Saul wants to get rich himself. He wants to make his friends rich. More importantly, he wants them to like him and honor and glorify him. Pride, vanity, rebellion. Verse 10, read with me. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all night. What does it mean that God regrets something? Is this saying that God doesn't know, didn't know what was going to happen? No. Later on in the passage, he'll make it very clear that he did know that everything that was going to happen. When God is telling Samuel, I regret making Saul king, what he's doing, he's helping Samuel see how deep his sorrow is. Remember the big point of First and Second Samuel? Listen to... Repeat it again with me. Life flourishes, flourishes when you listen to God. Death is introduced when you don't. But notice what God has said about Samuel. He has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. He's turned away from me. It's not just that Saul has made a mistake. When God chose him out of a crowd, he was a nobody. But now Saul thinks, ah, because God chose me, I must be a somebody. God helps him win all the battles, and now Saul thinks, well, God didn't really help me win the battles. It was because I was so magnificent and glorious, and my eyebrows were trimmed just right. Does that make sense? So every blessing that God has given Saul has been twisted in Saul's heart as evidence that he does not need to listen or follow God. This is pride. Read this with me. Pride says... I don't need God's help. All of God's help was just me doing all the work. I can do this on my own. Aw, oh, dang it. <clears throat> Some of you are being elbowed in the ribs right now. <laughs> Pay attention. See, pride always separates us from listening to or relying on God or anyone else. Pride always has us thinking, I have to do this by myself. I have to figure this out. Pride is you being so lost, you're convinced being found is when you declare yourself found. Pride is being so, as you being so lost, you're convinced being found is when you declare yourself found. Verse 13, Samuel just got done weeping as a result of all this. Verse 13, when Samuel reached him, Saul said, oh, the Lord bless you. I've carried out the Lord's instructions. So Saul's pride has grown into a monster. When we don't listen to God, we often don't even recognize it. We think we're all good. 
And part of following Jesus is actually having the strength to admit that you make mistakes all the time. Anybody in here perfect? Just a couple? Okay. Please see me afterwards. I have something to tell you. Um, we're more broken than we want to admit. Amen? Amen? If you want your family repaired, your life repaired, your heart repaired, you have to have the courage to admit that you make mistakes. If you want to do battle with your own pride, the first step is to openly need, admit, say, I need help. There's about 70% of you. Come on, y'all. Let's, let's all do it together. I need help. Yes. The second step is to follow directions, but I'm rushing it. I won't put too much on your plate this morning. So Saul says, hey, brother. And then Samuel says this. This is one of the funniest lines in the book. He says, what then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? <laughs> right? So the instructions were to destroy all of the supply chain of the Amalekites. Don't take any living animal alive. And Saul's like, I did it. I followed the Lord's instructions. <laughs> and Sam is like, are you, what, are you crazy? Like I literally can hear your disobedience. So it was Saul's idea to make captive their king as his trophy. It was Saul's idea to take all the animals of his own. It was Saul's idea to claim that he had completely and followed all of God's instructions. That's not good. My friend Christy Lang, when she was a child, she and her brother uh, would regularly climb onto the shelf to get Hershey's cocoa mix. Remember that? And they'd be all quiet and sneaky right? The, the chair would lightly drag across the kitchen floor and then they would get up on the counter and you know, just so quiet, right? And take down the cocoa mix. She might have been five. Her brother might have been three years old. And so then they're with the spoon, like raw cocoa mix, right? And then with the fingers in the cocoa mix. And then like Christy's mom comes to the kitchen and she's open, you know, because moms, by the way, when the house goes quiet, moms are like, what's wrong? Somebody is about to die. Like, this is it. And so Christy's mom walks in, and she opened the door and saw through the crack exactly what was happening. But um, so she says, uh, hey, did you guys get into the cocoa powder? And Christy says, oh, no. No, no, no. Uh, we would never do that. And what she didn't know is that she looked like this while while claiming that she was innocent. This is what Saul does. This is what we do. We convince ourselves that our disobedience is no big deal. And when God calls us out, we lie. Saul is covered in cocoa powder. So let's find out what his lie is. Verse 15, Saul answered, Oh, um, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. Isn't that great? A good leader always throws his friends under the bus. It's not my fault. It's their fault, right? Um, oh, and by the way, they spared the best of the sheep and the cattle to, oh, sacrifice to the Lord. It's for the church, Samuel. Don't worry about it. Yeah, right. Samuel erupts, verse 16. Enough! Samuel says to Saul, and then I won't read all the verses due to time, but basically Samuel just points out every single one of, li of Saul's lies up to this point in explicit detail. I mean, Saul is stuck, and let's read how Saul responds. Oh, but I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me, and I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag their king. And the soldiers took the sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord. Oh, how interesting. What is Saul doing? He's doing what we all do. Saul is trying to justify his disobedience and rebellion as him obeying God about how he actually did the right thing. Oh, and by the way, my intentions were good too. Well, I might have messed up on the details, but at least my intentions were in the right spot. But notice that Saul says, 
that he's going to sacrifice them not to my God, but to your God. Of course, what Saul doesn't say is that such a sacrifice would mean that all of his warriors would be able to eat barbecue and they would honor Saul as the victorious king, not God. And this is what we do when we confronted, we lie. When confronted again, we explain it away. When confronted again, we claim that our intentions are good. We don't want to admit that we choose to not listen to God, to listen to our own pride and fear, to please ourselves and others over God. And there is no freedom in covering up your mistakes like a cat covers up its mess. Does that make sense? It's still there and everybody can smell it. I have a friend, I have a friend, his two-year-old, when his two-year-old was in pull-ups, um, his two-year-old made a mess, right? And they've been working for a long time with this particular two-year-old. It'd be like, and he says, it was this sweet moment. He says, sweetheart, did, did you have an accident in your pants? And the two-year-old is like, no. <laughs> and my friend says, well, like, it's in there. And the two-year-old says, I didn't do that. <laughs> and the dad's like, you didn't do this? He said, nope, somebody else put it there. <laughs> That's what we do. We, 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 we say this to God, we say this to other people as though we could get away with it. Oh, I didn't mean to. It's not my fault. I know it's not a mistake. I, I didn't do it. They did. I was the wrong and it was the right intentions. And what we're trying to avoid is actually admitting that it was my vanity. It was my rebellion. That I had the arrogance to dismiss God's instructions as though he were nothing or a nobody and go my own way and assume it will all work out. That's what we want to avoid desperately. There is no freedom in trying to cover up your mistakes. And so the consequences for Saul are devastating. He will lose everything. Read with me. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? Of course not. The, God doesn't care about barbecue. I mean, he likes barbecue, but like, he doesn't want your, your so-called sorrow. He'd rather have you listen. And obey. To obey is better than sacrifice. To heed, that means to follow instructions. To heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of... Ooh. Rebellion is like calling on other spiritual powers to get what you want done. When you do not trust God to actually fight your battles and to take care of you, you will summon another source of power to get what you want. And arrogance, like the evil of idolatry, arrogance says, God, you're not who you say you are. You're a small, paltry little God that I can dismiss or disobey. That's like idolatry. And the consequences for Saul is this. Saul gets exactly what he wants. How terrifying. Saul wanted an arrangement where he could be the king and he didn't have to listen to God. And so Samuel says this, your wish is granted. Except the kingdom of Israel is kind of unique because the king of Israel listens to God. And therefore, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. You've lost your position. I hope that's what you wanted, Saul. If you insist on going your own way, God will let you. If you insist on trying to live by your own power, God will let you. If you are determined to not listen to God, God will let you. And the most terrifying moments of my life are when God handed me over to the full consequences of my own decisions. It brought isolation and misery and hopelessness and emptiness. But Saul isn't done. 
Verse 24, read this with me. Then Saul said to Samuel, Oh, I've sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back to me so that I may worship the Lord. And then once Saul learns of his consequences, then he's sorry. Does that sound familiar? Oh, what? Oh, I'm sorry. <sighs> if you're sorry because you got caught, that's not repentance. If you're sorry because you got grounded, that's not repentance. If you're sorry because someone found out what you really think about them, that's not repentance. And what is Saul's request? Well, at least come back with me so that we can worship together, which is basically Saul saying, hey, let's just keep this between you and me, Samuel. You come back with me. We'll all have the barbecue and party together. My troops will love me. Um, but you and I will know that, you know, like I'm really sorry. That's not repentance. Repentance is sorrow over the person I have harmed. Repentance is sorrow for my God whom I've cast aside as though he's nothing. It's sorrow that my arrogance and pride would have me acting like a knucklehead. And Samuel says, no, nah, that's not going to work for me, Saul. And as he walks away, Saul grabs his robe. And this happens. This is our last verse. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught a hold of the hem of his robe. Read this with me. And it tore. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors. That's going to be David next week. David will be a pimply 13-year-old, which makes this really funny. But that's next week. Why does Saul lose his kingdom? It's because Saul is so deeply committed to no longer listening to God. It's because he refuses to admit his mistakes. It's because he refuses to repent. Saul is me. I am Saul. I've done all of this. I wanted to be a pastor and at the same time numb, numb my pain at night by getting drunk. I wanted to proclaim God's love and faithfulness while at the same time refusing to believe it for myself. And my own rebellion and arrogance and pride and vanity was absolutely destroying me. And 10 years ago, April said to me, enough. And my choice was to keep on pretending that I wasn't an alcoholic or to actually repent and actually obey and actually confess and actually take the step to show up to AA and say, I have a problem I cannot solve by myself. So how many chances does God give Saul to repent? Four, five, six? So many. See, when confronted, Saul could have fallen flat on his face and said, yep, I've got a problem. And this is what happens with David. Nathan is going to call out David. This is in eight weeks and says, you're the man with the problem. And David goes, he doesn't explain it away. He doesn't pretend it's not there. He goes, uh, you're right. And David keeps his kingdom See, God isn't interested in punishing you. God is interested in transforming you and to be a woman who's after God's own heart and to being a man who's God after God's own heart. And in order to have that transformation take place, you have to be willing to say, I've got a problem that I can't fix with my own hands. Right? Yeah. Amen? Amen? So... To be a person after God's own heart isn't about being perfect. It's in having about having the courage to say, I'm more broken than I want to admit. Yeah. And all of this, what it does is it points to the reality that Saul's a lousy king. Guess what? David won't be much better. <laughs> and neither will Solomon and neither will the king after that, and the king after that, and the king after that, and the king after that, because the main character of First and Second Samuel aren't the kings. They're God himself. And what Saul points to is our need for a better king. The king we need, it's Jesus. Because Jesus is the only true king who brings justice yet 
spares his enemies. And he does so by dying for his enemies on the cross. Jesus is the only true king who listens to God the Father, even if it means sacrificing his own reputation and his own life as forfeit. He was obedient unto death. And Jesus is the only true true king who is the king of kings, and yet his rule is not one of violence, but one of love and unending mercy. Jesus is the only king who demands my allegiance and yet pays for my rebellion. He's the only king who asks for my obedience and yet obeys for me when I fail. Jesus is the only king worthy of my whole heart, my whole life, my very breath. So if you make a New Year's resolution this week, listen to God. Don't attempt this life without Him. And when you fail, don't run. Face it and repent. Be the kind of mom or dad that shows their kids how to repent by you demonstrating it. Be the kind of person who doesn't start by blaming their past or their circumstances or the politics or where they are in life, but says, you know, the only person that I know that I can change is me. Submit your whole life to the only king who's given up his own life so that you can be forgiven and set free. Amen? Amen. Lord Jesus, I thank you for my friends. I thank you for them staying with me after they've eaten coffee cake and warm coffee and it's like 83 degrees in here. (laughs) Jesus, would you give us hearts that move first towards repentance and not hiding? Would you give us hearts that move first towards confession and vulnerability rather than pretending that it's okay or that we've done nothing wrong? Jesus, would you give us hearts They would have the courage to love our friends and our family even when they're difficult, even when we know they have issues, but that we would actually start with our own. Would you open our ears to listen to you? Take out the confusion and the cotton balls, Jesus. Do this work in us, Holy Spirit. We make this dangerous prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Would you stand?